let's talk about scale fingering. As I have mentioned before, scale fingering on the harp is terrific because it's very flexible. Our scales can all have the same fingering if we want, or we can use different fingering. So let's start by talking about the basic scale fingering. In a one octave scale, it's pretty simple. We've got eight notes and four fingers, so we use them twice, right? Four, three, two, one, four, three, two, one, and then right back down with the same fingering. Easy. But what if we add extra octaves? What if the scale is longer than one octave? Well, remember that only one octave of the scale is going to actually have eight notes. All the other octaves really have seven, because there are, and I know this seems sort of counterintuitive, but there are seven different notes in an octave, right? I'm in G major here, so this is G, A, B, C, D, F sharp. And then the next note's a G, so that repeats. So those seven notes, G, A, B, C, D, E, F sharp, and G, form the octave, they form the eight notes, but the next octave is only gonna have seven different notes. So when we play a multiple octave scale, we want to have only seven fingers. So one of those groups of fingers can't be a group of four if we want to come out even on our thumb. So one way to look at it is that while that first octave is going to have eight notes in it and you can use a four finger group and a four finger group, each successive octave is going to require a three finger group and a four finger group for you to come out even. And that would be even on, on your thumb with your thumb at the top of the scale, right? So that you don't have sort of extra fingers kind of hanging in there. So. I mean, we could play four, three, two, one, all the way up as many octaves as we would want. But in three octaves, my thumb doesn't get to a G. And so that's what I'm talking about. So now, having said that, that we've got one octave that's gonna have two groups of four and every other octave having a group of three and a group of four, the order in which you put those is pretty much up to you. There's no one, right way to do it. So uh, one way I often do it is to start, and I start with a group of four, then a group of three, and I use a group of four and a group of three until I get to my last octave, and then my last group is a group of four. So I use four and three and four and three, and then my last octave is gonna be four and four. Now this allows me to play as long a scale as I want and just get that last group of four in at the end. And then going down, I can do the same thing. I can do a, kind of in reverse, a group of four, then a group of three, a group of four, a group of three, a group of four, and then finally, my last group is, all, is another group of four. So this gives me a way to continue the scale, stop it when I want, and have a pretty consistent fingering. However, there's nothing to say that you couldn't start with a group of three, then a group of four. And there's nothing to say you couldn't start with the two groups of four and do the threes or fours in either order after that, because the scale's gonna come out the same. We don't have like pianists do, we don't have black keys and white keys to have to maneuver around and which might make one fingering more convenient than another. So my suggestion for basic scale fingering is this. Pick one that you like, and you need to work these in multiple octaves. You need to, you need to be able to be comfortable with a two octave scale and a three octave scale in each hand. And of course, you're gonna practice them hands alone and hands together, right? But you're going to want to be comfortable with those multi-octave scales because they come up and because scales are a great way to practice finger flexibility. And I'll show you some fingering patterns that will push you even a little further in just a moment. But you want that fingering flexibility that a scale gives you in a way that no other technique really does on the harp. So scales are worthwhile, multiple octave scales especially. So pick a fingering that you like. If you wanna start with three and then four, if you wanna start with four and four, however you want to do it, 
but I would suggest that you try all of them and that you sort of mix that up so that you don't feel locked into one scale fingering. Having that flexibility, having all those fingering things in your toolbox, right? Your little technique toolbox is wonderful. It's what's going to give you the ability to react, to, um, to, to sight read, to, um, to do all the, the fingering that you might need to do for a specific piece to do that well and to do it pretty much instantly because all of those options will be open to you. So maybe you want to write out sort of one or two or maybe three different ways to finger scales that you really like and practice them on successive days. You don't need to do these the same every time. And in fact, I think it's a good idea that you don't. So that's one level of flexible fingering that you can get from practicing scales. But let's take that to the next level. And I'm going to show you a few scales that have very different fingering patterns that just test your finger flexibility in ways that may or may not show up in real music, but are really good for your technique. And they're kind of fun too. So one of the scale fingerings that's very useful is a scale fingering in just three fingers. Three, two, one, 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 two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. Now that comes out even, I mean, with your thumb on the top note, that comes out even in two octaves. But you know what? You can just keep going and do another octave if you like, or a half an octave even. you like you know what's different about a three two one scale well the cross under and cross unders are now with three and one so and you'll find that this feels very different from a four one cross under or crossover right it's it just feels different and you want to think about it the same way that we have talked about before so that your third finger and thumb feel balanced that there's enough room for your thumb to play and that your third finger is securely on the string to serve as a pivot as you replace the other fingers because you want to replace them all at the same time right so a three to one scale fingering you've seen that before you've used it very, very useful. You'll find plenty of situations in real music where the three, two, one scale is exactly what you need. And of course, a, practicing a three, two, one scale gives you options for combining groups of three and groups of four in a way that's situation specific and can solve a specific issue for you in a piece rather than just being, this is the way I play a regular scale when I'm warming up on scales or practicing scales. I do a group of four, a group of three, a group of four, a group of three. This will give you the ability to mix it up a little bit more. But let's go to one more level with that. What about a scale that's just two and one? Oh, I know you hadn't thought of that, right? Well, this may or may not be something that's useful in real music, but my goodness, is it useful for your fingers just to do two and one and then cross under with your second finger. This gives you a chance from a technique perspective, this gives you a chance to see how even your second finger and thumb can be in terms of dynamic and tone and to keep that really even. It also helps you really increase the space for your thumb so that you're, because if your second finger places too high, your thumb has no place to play at all. You want your second finger to place low and it, without pointing downward, we don't want that, just place low and once again, it could possibly help you solve a problem in a piece that you come upon. Any fingering option like this increases the, um, the number of ways you have to solve technical problems in a piece. Two and one so that it's light and fast and you know, whether you're going up or down is a wonderful freeing sort of a thing. So two and one, easy and good fingering to practice. What if we do the last combination that keeps the fingers in order, but removes a very critical finger. What if you were to practice a scale that didn't use your thumb? Now this is one that I find a lot of fun. 
and it's a challenge because we're used to using that thumb as an anchor for the rest of our hand. But if you just play four, three, two, and then cross under with four, you've got your second finger on the string, and then you're crossing under with four and replacing three and two. It's a three finger scale, sure, but no thumb. I had to look for that one. <laughs> so, and then on the way down, the same thing. Close your fingers, keep your arms steady. And as they used to say about the yellow pages back when we had telephone directories, let your fingers do the walking, right? They're just gonna walk, your, walk their way up and down the strings without that extra support of your thumb. It will help you find the balance point of your arm because the support of your arm here becomes super critical. You really need to use your arm to keep your hand steady because your thumb is not involved. When might you use this? All kinds of times. Perhaps your thumb is busy, you've got a some kind of situation, some kind of little melody there going on in your thumb, and you want these fingers, four, three, two, to be even. Maybe they're in a scale. And you want those fingers to be really even? This is a great way to do it. So these scales, working them slowly and then increasing in tempo are terrific for working on your finger flexibility. But what about speed? Well, let's talk about that next.